This is the age of isolation, but uh, I got to tell you, uh, you're looking good in that uh, necklace right there. Oh, well, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a while since I've had my uh, my own jewelry on. I got to say, it feels good. Cool, cool, cool. Is that an Aaron Bassett original? Yes, it is. It's a, um, this is a fabric necklace. That, as you can see, is one piece of fabric. What? And it's super lightweight. And then these are fabric earrings. If I take that off, you can, you can see they're dimensional. Yes. But watch this. Boop. Boop. So Light cute. as a feather. That's really cool. That is really cool. And they go with my latest accessory. Ooh, oh. nice. Wow, we're definitely going to want to talk about all of that. There's like a lot that you have There's going a on. Lot to talk about. <laughs> there is. There's a ton to talk about. And so I just want to remind the audience at home that Sophie Bonnet, our producer for today, is going to be taking questions and comments online. So if you have a question for Erin Bassett or comments, if you bought her stuff or want to, write it down in the comment section and we'll definitely get Sophie to read your comments and pose questions to our artist of the day. This art chat is with Aaron Bassett, and that's Aaron Bassett Artistry. Uh, what's your website, Aaron? Uh, it's pretty easy. It's AaronBassettArtistry.com. That's awesome. That is awesome. So do me a favor. Before we even get into you and get started with your studio and stuff like that, just tell us basically, what is it that you do as an artist and where do you work? Uh, I've been an artist my whole life. I started drawing and painting when I was uh, about four years old, um, went through school, took every art class I could ever find. I went to UF and got my degree in photography and I started, do, uh, started off as a photographer, did that for 10 years. Then I went back to school for textiles, got my master's degree, worked really hard for another 10 years, um, you know, doing odd jobs and you know, working in galleries in different museums and institutions around um, Fort Lauderdale Museum of Art, or I should say the NSU Art Museum now, um, the Art Institute on Fort Lauderdale, and that was around. So um, lots of different galleries down in Miami. But now I have my own studio, as you can see behind me. Yeah, it's awesome. I started my business about four years ago, and I opened this place, just celebrated my year anniversary in quarantine. <laughs> So, wow. and this is located in the Mass District in Fort Lauderdale. Wow, that's awesome. What, that's what, is the, what is that? What is the Mass District? The Mass stands for Music and Art South of Sunrise. Um, so we're a little strip where uh, we've got Mac Fine Art on one end and I'm on the other end and lots of independent, wonderful musicians, painters, potters um you name it there's an there's some a couple more jewelry people around here so we like to get together we have um art walks at the end of the month um every month uh, or at least we used to and we will again so uh that was a great way to kind of reach the community music food trucks you know that sort of thing and of course you could come in and buy art and support your local artists Oh, that's awesome. So you're saying that you've been, uh, you've been part of the Mass Art District for what, uh, about a, a year now? Uh, one year to the day, about four days ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. And what's it been like for your business to have this space amongst, you know, a whole group of artists? It, it changed everything. It was a way to be in a community. Again, I was working out of my home um, up until that point, And now I get to come and 
you know, be here, be amongst artists. It's great to um, sort of get ready for art walks every month. And then, like I said, get to meet people, make new friends, meet clients, you know, get my name out there to people who haven't met me before. Um, and then you sort of pack up the art walk and you get right back to production. So it's been really interesting to see the cycle over the past year. So, I mean, that that is amazing. And people, do they walk right in? Off yeah. the street and, and buy your product? Absolutely. They walk in, they discover me. Um, they come in, they start trying stuff on. They call people from outside. Oh, hey, so-and-so, you got to come in here and see this. And yeah, and then they become clients and they come to uh, some of the individual events that, that I have outside of Art Walk, uh, like Wine and Wares. Um, we mm -hmm. come in and I have some alcohol sponsors come in and um, we do a little wine tasting, do a little shopping and that sort of thing. And it's a really fun, really intimate way um, to, to buy the pieces. Oh, that's uh, that is like really, really cool. And uh, before we get into our, our next uh, segment with you, I want to ask our producer, Sophie. Hey, Sophie, are there comments coming in on Facebook? Are people watching right now? We have, yeah, we have tons of people watching. You have a lot of fans, Erin. Um, Jennifer, yeah, Jennifer says, hi, Erin. Heart, heart, heart. Um, hi, Jennifer. <laughs> your fabric jewelry is unreal. As seen and touched in person, really gorgeous. And I agree. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and we have a comment from Tom. Um, Aaron curated the exhibition Textured at our serve last um, last year. That was a DBA ex uh, the DBA mm -hmm. exhibition. Yes. I remember that. Um, uh, can she tell us about that experience and what advice can she give? Um, can she offer to up and coming artists? Oh, the DBA. Um, the DBA was an amazing experience, and I'll just do a little back history. I took the artist as entrepreneur um, Institute sort of workshop. It's a four week, four weekends long in the summertime that the cultural division and art serve help put on. And it's really an amazing resource for artists to learn how to become career artists, not just hobbyists. So I started by taking that course. Um, I took that course in 2015, I believe. Then I applied to be in the DBA exhibition. And that's when I was discovered by the um, Spectrum Miami people and was able to then go on and show during Art Basel in Miami. Um, which was amazing. So I did that for two years um, after the DBA show. And then I then I decided to, to, to do a little curation. I've always wanted to curate and kind of dip my toe in that with the DBA. So um, what I would say to artists that are that are looking to kind of make the, the next step is you definitely got to come up with one, a product, um, you know, that nobody else has or is unique to you, your point of view and make like, I don't know, a thousand of them. And I'm not even kidding you. Like you need to get into production, make it a bunch of times because all those reiterations are going to narrow down and get down. I mean, the first time I made this necklace, it didn't look like this. Um, you know, this is after about a thousand times of making it, um, that, I was able to get it precise and exact every single time. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is apply. If you wanna get into shows and be an exhibiting artist, you've got to apply. Um, and there is lots of resources out there to do that. You can do cafe management. Um, you can do uh, juried, um, juried exhibitions. Um, I forgot the exact website for that, um, but I can I can put those in the comments. There's lots of resources out there. Um, you know, Google shows. Get figure out what your category is and get to those shows and apply for it. The nice thing about DBA is that it's only for AEI graduates. So your pool of artists that you're competing with is very small comparatively to say a national. Uh, competition or exhibition. So applying um, dedication and coming up with that amazing product. Um, and you'll know it's amazing when you have people coming in and they tell you it's amazing. That's how you know. Because <laughs> that's what happened to me. I figured out I had a great product when I showed it to people and they told me they loved it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to keep going with this one. 
Definitely. Man, that, is, that is so cool. We want to give the audience at home a little, you know, add to your backstory and show them a little video of you making artwork. And so I want to show this and then um, it's about 40, 40 or 50 seconds and we want you to react to it uh, after it plays. So here is okay. a little bit of history on Aaron Bassett and I hope you guys can see this okay. My favorite fabric to use is silk because of its sculptural quality. So it, when you add heat to silk, it will retain the shape that you put into it. I, when I take my plain piece of fabric, I actually put metal and glass objects inside of them. I, the metal I have found helps to conduct the heat when I'm heating the fabric. And so I'll take glass beads and metal washers and different things that I, objects that I find, and I wrap the fabric around them, secure it with rubber bands. After I finish the whole sheet of fabric, then I take that and put it into a pot of boiling water. And that's where I add the heat and some dye elements and that sort of thing. I take the rubber bands and the objects out and I'm left with this really kind of um, light and airy sculpted fabric. Wow, that is absolutely, that is absolutely incredible. I, I've I never have, seen anything like that. I had no idea that you can do like, you can achieve that type of texture with fabric. It's just, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And I have to say that Jason at Eight Shades of Blue did a great job with that video. So shout out to another local artist that's making his living, uh, creating amazing things. Yeah. So, hey, we have some questions on Facebook. Um, okay. Does Erin teach Yuri making classes? Do you teach? I, I do not. Um, I do teach several... Uh, different techniques, um, including drawing with fabric, is one thing that I that I do teach, along with um, Unbelievable, which is a weaving workshop where I actually teach people how to make their own fabric. Oh, um, wow. Pretty interesting. But um, I do not teach this um, technique. I do not teach how to make my jewelry right. um, for proprietary purposes. So where do you teach? Is it in your studio or are you, are you doing some virtual classes? Like uh, right I was teaching in my studio, uh, but now I guess I, I can do some virtual stuff. Yeah, I can switch it up. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Sign me up. And awesome. we, have another, we, have, <laughs> we have another question. Um, can Erin tell us about her journey from invention to production to distribution and how how she do it? So how did you do it, Erin? How did I do it? Okay. So um, I started off making everything myself. Um, like I said, I made hundreds of different iterations um to create the final piece and including measuring where i put each object and really practiced how i created each piece and started writing down those things in in anticipation of teaching somebody else um, or coming up with some sort of method um, to do that so one of the things that happened was um sort of a stroke of luck but it also had to do with the fact that I did shows, I said yes, I put myself out there. Um, I said yes to a lot of different opportunities, regardless of, you know, big or small. And I was at somewhat of what I would consider a small-ish event um, at another local store called Southern Sands Designs. Um, so I'd like to do a little shout out to Roman and Marcus over in Southern Sands Designs. They invited me to do a very special, very intimate show with just a couple of other artists, their clientele, my client list. And um, I set up my stuff within their shop and it was right around the holidays. So we were um, selling, you know, small gift items and that sort of thing. And I had made this incredible necklace for my wedding, actually, that I didn't end up wearing for the ceremony. So I decided to, to sell it. And within five minutes of putting it out, I sold it to a woman who just fell in love with it, bought it for her sister, and then took a picture of it and sent it up to one of her girlfriends in Atlanta, who happened to be the wife of an accessories dealer at the America's Mart in Atlanta. And 
they reached out to me. They said, do you have sales representation? I said, no, but I could really use some. Wow. <laughs> and, um, and I flew up and I presented my line and I came home with a contract and that changed everything. So I started wholesaling from that point on. And when those orders started to come in and be too much for me to do with my own two hands, that's when I started um, to sort of get other people involved in teaching uh, very specific other artisans here in the area, keeping it local, keeping it in the U.S., keeping it handmade. Um, and she calls herself Erin, too. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's incredible. So you've been so successful that you've had to bring in a team to help work with your, your technique. Yeah. From, from that one sale down here, from that one email that she wrote, I now have 50 wholesale clients throughout the country, including Canada. Okay. So I want to I wanna dive in right there because there's a lot of artists watching and, and ArtServe is an arts advocacy organization. We, we want artists to be successful just like you. Can you tell tell me and tell our people at home how long it took to go from contract one to 50 stores? Is, is this a year, stores. three years? Uh, about one year. Yeah, but it took about nine shows. Um, and it happened in, in a, a give or take, but it happened in about a year. So, um, so that was incredible. And I will say that, um, you know, you... Art to other artists to go back on the question that Sophie had a lot of my advice is a lot of artists don't know how to price their work and you have to think about what your wholesale price is and what your retail price is um, and your wholesale price has to include profit for yourself or else you'll never make any money. What, um, what do you consider and you don't have to give away your particular numbers but if right. an artist is working on their pricing what percentage of their price for wholesale should be their personal take home? So, so percentage profit from your wholesale price um, should be between 25 and 50%. And wow. then your, your retail price, um, your profit margin is more around 80 or 85%. Um, so, you know, you've got to be able to make that money on the wholesale side. Um, and then the retail side is just gravy. But I will say that my wholesale price um, is about two and a half times uh, what my wholesale price is. Um, you never, as an artist, you never want to undercut your stores. So you never want to sell it for less than what you're selling it for. You want to sell it for more. Wow. Yeah. And so Let's give our audience at home um, a little more history on Aaron Bassett. We want to show them more about you. We have okay. a video and um, we're going to go from you to you in a video. And uh, we're going to share uh, a little history about you. And then when we come back, we're going to talk a little more with Aaron Bassett in her amazing silk shibori technique. And we're going to talk about that word shibori right after this. The necklaces can go from simple everyday wear to something really outrageous over the top fashion editorial, you know, kind of pieces. When I did the Artopia event and I dressed models and they were wearing different colors and I put four or five necklaces on them and they just sort of walked around and it became, they became living art pieces. You got to tell me, Erin, how, how did you get these opportunities? to dress models in your in your work. I mean, that's amazing. The Artopia event was really fun. Um, that was put on jointly uh, with the um, Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce um, and their um, LGBTQ subset um, division of that of the chamber. Um, and I was out at a networking group um, and I met some people that just loved my my work and invited me to be a part of that. And that was a fundraising event and that was really, really fun. I got to work with um, models from Posh Models. Um, like I said, the chamber, it was at the NSU Art Museum. It was all, it was a lot of the South Florida community coming together um, to raise money. So that was a fantastic event. 
So uh, that is that is awesome, and I think that's really inspirational for artists who are watching you right now. Uh, let's go. Let's go back to some questions on Facebook. Sophie, are there any uh, more comments? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, you have um, you received many many compliments. Everyone loves your work. Uh, we do have a question from Lisa. She's asking if you um, if you ever do this process as a, as a wall hanging. And Jill is asking if your materials are expensive. Okay, so I do, I definitely do this as a wall hanging. Um, and here, I'm actually going to move the, move the camera so you guys can see a little bit more of my studio. So here is a wall hanging um, right here. There's one up there. Oh, wow. And this is actually what I showed at, uh, at ArtServe for DBA. Um, you can see there's one, there's one in the back there, um, up on the top, that's Ocean Wave. Um, there's my, my, uh, my lovely model in <laughs> the Lady Gaga dress. Um, Aaron, I do, yes. Can you swing the, uh, the camera back to the other wall and just give us a sense of the size? What's the scale of those pieces that we see on the wall there? Okay, well, those two things in front of it are chairs. So, there we go. So this is how this is how big it is. Wow, and and if you don't mind, what do you sell these for in a gallery setting? Um, in a gallery setting, I believe they they go for somewhere between eight and ten thousand. That's incredible. Uh, that one in particular, this one here, um, is actually on four canvases. So they all fit together to look like one. You can space them apart to show a few inches of the wall paint behind it. Um, you can face two and two across the room or you can do all four straight down a hall. So it's a, it's a very versatile piece. And uh, yes, to answer the second part of that question, um, I work primarily with silk, which is, yes, very expensive. Um, it's close to $30 a yard. So, wow. so wow. I see you wearing your product now. I see the earrings. I see the necklace. The necklaces in particular, because we can see them above you. And I'm going to yes. go to a larger view so we can see just you. Um, we see a whole variety of necklaces. Are you able to tell us the story of how you arrived to this art form becoming wearable? How did, how did you get there? Uh, well, I did start on the wall. Um, that was where I started with my schoolwork um, and that sort of thing. And um, I had a request from a, from a special client to make a fabric tree. So I made this tree and it went um, it was for a nursery. So it went in the corner and it went up the nursery wall in the corner and up over the ceiling and it came down with these tendrils of moss. It was a Winnie the Pooh themed nursery. Um, so it was super cute. As I was installing the tree, they wanted to make sure that they were going to be able to take down the tree so that the child could take it to college, which I thought was the most adorable <laughs> comment ever. And so I was making the tree in my studio in parts and I had my mother in there with me and my mother suffers from um, Alzheimer's unfortunately. And at that point, when I would bring her in the studio with me, she would sort of come back to me. Um, she would come back to me for ab about an hour or so and we could talk and we were, I had her helping me to take um, the pieces apart after they had been boiled. And she kept asking, you know, what are we making? And I'd say, we're making moss. And she'd look at it and work a little bit longer. And she'd say, what are we making? And I'd be like, mama, we're making moss. She asked me this like five or six times as we were going along and she got it all undone and she kind of looked at it and she was investigating it and she was, you know, kind of twisting it around and looking at it. And, and I was just waiting for the question of what are we making? Um, which was very hard because the tree wasn't built at the time. So it was a really hard concept, um, for her, but anyway, she, she looked at it and she went like this and batted her eyes at me 
And I went, oh my God, necklaces. That's what I'm going to make. I'm going to make necklaces. And wow. I, the, I, within that, within that week I made four and they sold and I made six more and they sold. And for months after that, I could not leave the house. I mean, I had to think about it. Like if I put this on and wear this out, I, can I part with it? Or is it like a prototype or is it going somewhere? Because people were buying them off of my neck every single time wow. I walked out of the house. That's amazing. So that's amazing how journey. I knew. Yeah, that's how I knew. Um, well, one, it came from my mother. So that, that made it very a very very special product um for me and two it goes back to what i was saying my advice earlier to other artists is if if that starts happening if you start if you touch on something and you hit a nerve and your clients and people that are out and about with you and people that you interact with are giving you those sorts of that sort of feedback pursue that um, because the wall art is great. I love making it. It's, I, I have been successful, but that client is very few and far between and the necklaces and the jewelry accessories. And I've moved on to earrings and purses. And now I have masks. The, the accessories that I make are, are what keep, keep my doors open. Um, and it's all because of my mother. It's all because of her. Aaron, I, I have to say, I've, I, I don't think I've ever heard a story like that. And it's, it's incredible. It's deep. It's so real. I, I have to, t I, I, you know, I want to see your other products, but before we even go there, you know, how has this enhanced or deepened or strengthened your relationship with your mother, particularly with the Alzheimer's? How, how, how do you handle that? Um, it's not easy. It's, it's something that, um, you know, I struggle with, uh, but it's a, it's a way that I can keep a connection with her. Um, the, I, I say all the time that the fabric has a memory. It remembers what I do to it, but she doesn't, um, she doesn't know what my name is anymore. And she doesn't know that I'm her daughter. Um, but she knows who I am and she knows the love that, that we have. She lights up when I walk in the room uh, and she's always with me. I have her all over the studio. Um, she's constantly here with me. And um, here. this is- You have a photo. You have a photo of your mom. Yeah, this is her. Let's zoom in there. There we go. Can you can you push that a little closer? There you go. Yeah. Yeah, that is completely inspirational. Um, Sophie's crying. Oh my god. <laughs> and um, you really touched both of us with that story. Uh, that's that's incredible. Um, here, she's always here, and she's always here. Do and you? Do, do you use this energy? Is there anything here that, that you have? Because I see creating with a cause. Is yes. that philanthropic? Is Aaron Bassett Artistry as a business um, doing that? Or is that you personal? Uh, both, both. But I do, I do donate um, a portion of my proceeds to the Alzheimer's Association. Um, every purchase uh, gets a donation, wholesale or retail. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work. I, I do walks every year um, with the group. So these are the boxes that you get with every necklace. Um, so with every per purchase, there is a little reminder of, um, of your contribution to the cause as well. How fantastic is that? that? So you've actually made philanthropy part and parcel of your business model it's literally on the boxes yeah it's on the boxes it's when you walk in the door it's um my my mother would have been so proud of me to have this studio work as hard as i have for as long as i have and she would have just been here at every art walk and 
you know, singing my praises. She actually probably would have been sewing right there with me because she's the one who taught me how to sew. So it, it's, I miss her so much every day. And because of this stupid Rona virus, I haven't been able to see her since March 3rd. Wow. So but it's very hard. It's very hard. So, but in, in, and everything that's going on and my work with the Alzheimer's Association so far up to this point, um, I have learned that giving back gives me so much more than what I give. I mean, I feel guilty sometimes that I don't give more because the Alzheimer's Association, the people that I've met, the connections I've made, um, the locals here, I mean, working with Alex Levy and, and, and Jennifer, uh, you know, there and Amy and everybody else ha has just been amazing. They're so supportive. Um, you know, when you come in, uh, you can, when you come into my studio, I have Alzheimer's pens and Alzheimer's bracelets and all kinds of stuff. And, and I can share information and it's, it's unfortunate, but I've had so many personal connections with clients. Uh, I have cried many, many times in my showroom in Atlanta with wholesale clients that have lost mothers or sisters or aunts um, to this horrible disease I've made. This is actually, the one I'm wearing is actually Alzheimer's purple. So this is my signature wow. color shade of purple because it matches the Alzheimer's Association logo. Um, Aaron, I, I, I have to tell you, you, you know, you just mentioned your mom being proud of you. And I got to tell you, just sitting here in this interview, I'm proud of you. Like that is, that is so powerful. And you know, you've been to AEI, that's for the people watching at home, the Artist as Entrepreneurial, uh, Entrepreneur Institute. It's also a tongue twister. Um, <laughs> but I've also given speeches there. And part of my speech at AEI is always that it is mandatory that if you're gonna run an art business, that you marry a philanthropic cause to your artistry mm -hmm. and you're telling me you can't even walk down the street without somebody buying something off your necklace and you know that's going right back to the charity that you support i i gotta tell you you're the living example of the lesson and i applaud you i applaud your success and i i think what you're doing is a model that a lot of artists can learn from Thank you so much, Ed. I really appreciate that. She's she's a very very special um, woman, and it's a very it's a very special part of my business. Um, and I will tell you, a lot of times, like sort of just like in this interview, once I start talking about that, you know, I, I sort of drop off the sales the salesman part, and you just get real. You can't pick a philanthropy that you don't feel strongly about either. You can't just pick one out of the sky and be like, all right, I'm going to support dogs. Cause I like dogs. It has to, it has to be authentic and it has to come from within you and your personal experience um, with that. And whether I end up making a sale to a client or not, the ones that come in and start crying and hugging me and thanking me for, for contributing to the cause is what makes it, all worth it. And actually the woman that I'm working with, that's helping me, um, they sort of brought on, um, to help me create the pieces, um, lost her mother and four of her aunts to the disease. So oh she told me it's one of the reasons why she wanted to work with me in the first place. So, um, unfortunately it's a connection I have with a lot of people. Um, and I'm happy to, to talk and reach anybody that wants to reach out, you know, after the interview and talk about it and, um, you know, let me know what they're going through. If they've, if they've just encountered this or been a recent diagnosis or anything like that, I'm, I'm here. It's been a 10 year journey. Um, how can for, people, how can people find you if they want to have a dialogue with you on this subject? How can they find you on social media? Uh, Aaron Bassett artistry on Facebook. And uh, Sophie, our producer, will put that in the comment section. Um, we're getting comments on Facebook. Uh, we're getting comments on the Zoom meeting chat with you. Uh, we have some guests who have joined in. Uh, Sophie, do you have any comments from the Zoom chat? 
Yes, we do. We have uh, comments and questions. I'm gonna go. Um, I'm gonna read some of the comments first. Uh, Maria Teresa. Um, she's saying hi, Erin. Um, I can really picture you in the atelier. Uh, my first piece. Uh, she bought it from our serve a few years ago. Great talk. Um, uh, we love you, Erin. Um, you are an inspiration to all of us. Uh, so proud of you. Um, Scott, he's saying, Erin, your story and work are powerful and your work is innovative, innovative in the industry. Which Amazing. I totally agree. Scott, I totally is from, agree. Scott is from my second showroom. So this year I was supposed to bring on a second showroom um, out in the, out the, the Dallas Market Center. And um, it's the um, Brand 13 agency. And I was really, really excited um, to go out to Dallas and meet the whole team out there um, and get some new clients. But we're doing it virtually. And, um, you know, we got, got our first order this week. Um, it happened to be for masks. It didn't look like what we thought it was going to be. But he's you know he's been he's been marketing with me and 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 believes in the line and believes in me so i'm so grateful to to have him in my corner and the whole team there and they're doing zoom meetings every day too um to help connect the designers you know and the and the brands together uh to, and the stores that he works with so you know despite everything that's going on and despite the social distancing where we are really all are together. Wow, that's actually amazing because we're going from your personal story that's tied to the necklaces and now we're talking about Corona and you have, what you're telling is you have another product. So let's let's see that. What Do you have a, a, some samples or do you have some I work? I do, I have some samples. So my my mother loved orchids. She grew orchids. She, we, she and I and my father all have orchid tattoos. We have 30 orchids on our, on our back patio right now. Um, so I chose this beautiful fabric. This was one of the first ones I made and, um, it's called mother's orchid because she totally would love it. So, uh, this is my, my latest product. Um, and these are fashion face covering masks. Wow. That is amazing. Uh, can you hold that up for the camera closer, a little closer? Mm, I love the pattern. Yeah, absolutely. And I see that they have these little folds in them. Yeah. And can you explain, like, why why did you put those folds in? Um, so that the um, so that I can give you a lot of covering from your nose all the way up to your chin and out to your cheeks. And also, they all have um, filter pockets in the back. So if you have an extra filter, an N95 filter or something like that, um, you can put that in. Um, and they all have nose wires across the top for extra added fit and security. Can you, so can you give us a little demo? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is so cool. Oh, wow. So and it goes with the earrings and the necklace. <laughs> yes. Styling. So safety, right? A yes. little bit of safety, a little bit of style, right? Or maybe I should say a lot of style. I hope so. <laughs> Now, would you say it's a little, is it too much to do the mask, the earrings, and the necklace all together? Uh, I don't think it's ever too much. <laughs> maybe, maybe some people might call that extra. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Good so, answer. obviously, we've been dealing with lockdowns. We've been dealing yeah. with social distancing. We've been dealing with social uh, isolation. How long have you actually been making these masks? Well, when the lockdown first happened, I had a, you know, I'm an artist. I had an emotional reaction to it. I had a lot of orders for wholesale clients that were supposed to be shipping out literally that week. And they all called and said, we're closing our stores. Please hold my order until further notice. And I basically like walked out, you know, walked out the studio, locked my door and went home. And I didn't know what was going to happen. And for the first couple of weeks, I shopped, I cooked, and I drank. And that's like in, in that order. I don't, I don't see a problem. Yeah. I, I, I really don't. 
for the first two weeks, you get a free pass yeah. on alcohol and whatever consumption you want to get into. The first, the first two weeks were really hard. A lot of fear, a lot of the unknown, a lot of like you not know, knowing what's going to happen. And with the help of my wonderful husband um, and my family, you know, he kind of looked at me and was like, what's, what's going on? What's happening with you? And with that, you know, sort of question, I was like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening with me. And I, you know, I sort of pulled myself out of the funk and I started exercising every day and I started meditating. I laid off of the news as much as I could and really kind of pulled myself out there. And I had a couple of people asking me, some friends and uh, some clients and stuff. And I realized that I have a friend who had cancer 10 years ago. I have a girlfriend that had breast cancer last year. Um, I have a girlfriend that is recovered from Guillain-Barre syndrome. I have my 77 year old father that I live with now. And I started realizing that I could probably do something to help them out. So just like the necklaces, I made a few masks. And I made some prototypes and um, that sort of thing. And I just sort of went from there. And then last week, um, I went out and I bought some fabric and made a few masks and just kind of threw them out there and said, hey, everybody, I'm making masks now. And boom. So Aaron Artistry has a whole new product line. Okay. So boom. What's defined boom? Five masks, <laughs> 10 masks. How many masks did you make and what were your sales like? Um, I have made about 70 masks in about 30 orders. 30 orders. 30 you orders spent... in, in a week. So you're averaging two masks per order, right? Is, right. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got, you know, a half, half a dozen, you know, orders that have one, and then I have several that have six or eight, you know, that sort of thing. So I had one, I had one client that ordered 24. Wow. Yeah. So, wow. that was, so yeah. You bought it for the whole office or something. Yeah, that's exactly right. Friends, family, people in her office, um, you know, so the response has been incredible. Well, has it, has it, is it just that style? You showed us the orchid or. Yeah, no, I have, um, I have lots of different styles. So uh, to sort of celebrate my, uh, you know, my drinking and the Cinco de Mayo that's coming up, I have this one, which is. I love um, Do I see yeah. martini glasses? Oh, they're margaritas. Margaritas. Nice. <laughs> nice. I like it. And, and, um, and then this one is actually martinis here. Oh, you got to hold that to the camera. We got to see the martini glasses. Oh, yes. That is really something. They have little, little red swizzles. Love so I would definitely, definitely suggest you put a nice pair of red earrings in there. Just really, really pick up on that red accent. And can you do me a favor and hold that earring close to the camera so everyone at home can see those bubbles? Now that's that's silk, right? Yes. That is amazing. Uh, show us, please. Show us another mask. We'd love to see some more. All right. So this one has been. This one is new. Um, so this one's been really, really popular. It's called Blue Tranquility. Oh my goodness, that's gorgeous cute that is beautiful yeah very so artistic do. oh nice there you go nice yeah well done take out that pink and there you go see it's not too much right sophie would you want uh, to wear these masks down the street a hundred percent yes please so <laughs> hey so I have a comment. So uh, Maria Teresa, she's saying, uh, now I know that the meaning of the material you choose for the mask I've bought. Can't wait to receive it in Canada. I've been thought, I'll have a thought for your mom every time I wear it. That's so um, sweet. Um, and so uh, some of the ladies here are asking, like, how long does it take uh, to make one of the necklaces? And also, how, um, how long does it take you to do also the big uh, conceptual pieces 
Mm, the big ones, the big ones are several months. Wow. I mean, they, they take a really long time to make. Um, so you can imagine it's, you know, this much work, you know, times 40 or 50 inches wide, um, and that sort of thing. So, um, the months and months and months for the, the wall pieces, uh, for sure. The necklaces average about four hours a necklace. So I can make, if I really, if I really put my hands to the grindstone and like pump them out, I can make about 30 ish in a week. Oh, that's okay. Wow. Yeah. And where, where can we buy them? Um, you can buy them at Aaron Bassett Artistry. Um, I also have um, a whole lot of clients all over the Southeast um, and the rest of the country that carry the, the pieces as well. So I've got a great store in Fort Myers um, called The Art of Fashion and More. I've got um, one on Hilton Head uh, called Pyramids. They have two locations. Um, so I've got, I've got, Suzette's on the rocks. I mean, I could go on and on and on with my client list, but yeah, you can get them at Aaron Bassett Artistry or find them at your local um, high fashion boutique. So I see that um, you showed us the earrings. You yes. showed us the necklace. Do you have any other accessories that go with your style? The shibori. I do. I do. Let me show you. Let me show you this one. So this one is. This one's a great one. This one's called um, Beach Blanket. Because I thought it looked like an awesome beach towel, very South Florida. Um, so again, I'm going to put the wire nose um, across the bridge of my nose with the pleats going down in the front. Um, because that's important. You don't want the pleats going up and catching all those corona germies, right? You want the pleats going down. And I'm just going to put the elastic around my ears. Like that. Okay. And then I came out with a new product um, last year. This is my vegan leather clutch. Whoa. So each clutch uh, comes with a crossbody strap as well. So you can wear it as a evening bag or a crossbody look. Wow, that looks really cool. Right? And even though I have a mask on, I have my face covering, I still look really stylish. I'm ready to go out to a social distance party. <laughs> Amazing. So you, just like the, just like the necklaces and the earrings, is this, is this multiple styles or do you just have like this one black clutch version? Um, no, here, why don't I put, why don't I put this one? So this one was beach blanket and this one I'm going to put on right now is called, um, light galaxy. And I only have six of each of these left. So wow. these are just about to be sold out. So this one's a really nice black and white pattern. Again, I'm going to, uh, let's see. Oh, I almost put it on backwards. So I'm going to pinch the nose with the pleats going down. Put that on. Okay, and now so I'm gonna far, take, so good. Now I'm gonna take the silver, right? And then it has the black and white flowers. And again, I'm ready to go. I love the pattern on that one. Yeah. 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 And this and one has got the soft cute. Can we take a peek inside the purse real quick? Yep. This one has black lining. It has a crossbody strap. And it even has some of my uh, rack cards in it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, that's really awesome. Cool. Yeah. So our friends from Facebook, they're asking, uh, where do you buy the silk? Do you get it in the U.S.? Um, well, I, I do buy it from a place in New York. Um, but we actually, as a country, do not make silk fabric anymore. So I believe that the silk comes from Thailand. Um, and there's a lot of great places in India um, that make great silk. Um, if anybody's watching that actually produces uh, machine woven Shantung solid color silk in the U.S., please reach out to me because I'll buy it from you. <laughs> Aaron, I mean, you have so many uh, products. I see multiple colors. 
I see oh, more yeah. shapes and sizes, and now yeah. you've got masks. Oh, look at that. So this is, I don't know if, I don't know if it's really coming out, but this is black and gold. Yeah. Some gold sparkles, so I'm gonna put that in. Do you ever get requests for, uh, from people when they say, I want a particular color earring, or I want a particular color of oh, yeah. a necklace? Can you do that for people? Yes. I gotta say, I'm really, really good at color. So it's one of my specialties. I can match just about anything. I one time had a had somebody send me a stone that she had actually made like a a purse with. She was a she was from the Palm Beach Beaters Association. So they would they did beading, which I don't do at all. I went and did a presentation. She loved my presentation. She was like, oh, they're they were all like, oh, how do you do that? It's so so tedious. I'm like, you guys do beadwork. What is more tedious than beadwork? It was crazy. So we were both admiring each other's skills. And she sent me the stone and a picture of the purse and asked for a custom scarf to go with it. And um, it came out beautifully. Wow. What has been like kind of like the craziest request um, or custom order that you've received? Oh, that's a, um, uh, so I just did a custom dress. Uh, it was, she's a client came in and she saw a dress that I had made already in, in my shop and she loved it, but it was a little bit out of her price range and not quite the right size. So she asked a lot of questions about how I did it and how I made it. And she actually went out found a dress very similar to that that she could wear that was her size brought it back to me brought a pair of shoes um that were purple and green and peach and just gorgeous shoes purple sole nice high heel ruffle whole thing and said make me a dress to match these shoes and i said okay what kind of what she was like no no make me a dress Wow. Didn't, didn't want any input. Didn't want to tell me which direction, you know, even sent her pictures halfway through the dress and was like, here's what it is so far. And I could do this or this. She was like, yeah, whatever you, she's like, yeah, whatever you want to do, do it. And I was like, that is very unhelpful. <laughs> she gave you, she gave you carte blanche. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She just, she said she loved everything I did, loved what I, what I made and wanted me to do it. So I just, I went with my gut and I made those, those hardest, those, the hard decisions as in once you commit, you, you can't ever go back. I was working with dye. Wow. So I, what I ended up doing was I, it was a very spaghetti strappy dress and I wanted these ruffles to kind of go up her neck. So I made a base. Um, and then the, the, the flower, the, ruffles kind of went in and out and then tendrilled down and I made it removable from the dress so that she was able to dry clean the dress and even switch it out if she wanted to put it with a t-shirt and jeans she could do that I mean I'm sort of known as like the necklace lady so I thought why not make her a necklace because we as women we we fluctuate right we don't <laughs> Never stay in the same size. I, I wish well, you know. know I, so I wish you know. Yeah, you don't know. So listen, <laughs> I wanted to um, I want to thank all of the our audience for writing in, and I want to encourage you keep writing comments and questions. And if you like what you're seeing from Aaron Bassett, press the little like uh, button, the thumbs up, press the little heart button, and show your love to Aaron Bassett. And we're gonna do one more video for the audience at home. And while we're watching this video, uh, we're going to check it out, press that heart button, and we'll come back and talk to Erin a little more about her Silk Shibori style. We have this one video from her past. It's just about 30 seconds. And here we go. The fabric has a memory. It remembers the impression that I make on it. The entire technique, starting with putting the objects in, boiling, everything I do to it, the fabric remembers. And it's not lost on me that I'm using a technique that's 3,000 years old. So to me, the work is all about memory. Erin, 
3,000 years old. 3,000 years old. I did not invent this. That? What's that? Can you tell us about that? Uh, tell us about the technique and how did you fall into a technique that was been, you know, so ancient? Um, well, I was in grad school and I was taking a, uh, a materials class and uh, materials and processes class. And the instructor wanted 10 samples a week, which was a lot because I was taking three other classes. So I was doing a lot of stuff with with melting polyester and stacking things and really trying to get a, a two dimensional flat fabric up into three dimensions. So one, at one point about halfway through, she said to me, you know, if you do this with silk, it'll keep its shape. And I was like, what, what, what? Tell me more. I'm like, I have to know. She's like, yeah, work with silk. So I said, okay. And then I went home and I started with silk. And um, let's see, I have it right here. So this right here was the first, was the, can you all see this? Yes, please keep going. Okay, so this is the first uh, sample that I ever did um, with it. And she said, okay, now I want you to do 10 samples a week in this technique. And I never stopped. I did, uh, I, I did the, my, my samples and then I moved on to the wall and then I discovered necklaces and I just haven't stopped uh, from there. So yeah, silk, silk shibori is about 3000 years old. Um, it's a Japanese technique and I, uh, I just absolutely fell in love with it. I can't stop doing it. And this is my, my silk accessory line is my interpretation of technique plus materials. And that's how I create my stuff. I gotta say, I've never seen anything like it. And then these videos uh, that we uh, are showing of your work and your yeah. style, literally, I've never seen anybody create artwork this way. So the little bubble that we see there, if you can hold that up for the audience, you boiled that with a marble, yes. right? Yes. Right. And how did you get those folds and ruffles and stuff? So I use metal objects, uh, discs mostly, um, and glass, um, anything that can withstand two hours of boiling. Um, wow. So it can't, I can't use cardboard or anything like that. I like to use the metal because it conducts the heat on the inside as well. Um, so it's sort of, and then I secure it with rubber bands. Um, I boil it and that's when I add different colors uh, to the dye bath and that sort of thing. So uh, once it's dry, it takes about 24 hours because the material's all, all bunched up. It also takes about three times the amount of fabric. So if I want to make a 10, something 10 by 10, I have to use 30 by 30 fabric. So it shrinks up about 30%. Once wow. it's dry, I take the rubber bands out, I remove the objects and then there's nothing wow. left inside. Wow. I mean, this is amazing. And, and can you slip another one on and let's see it on your, uh, uh, around your neck. We want to check it out. What, yeah. Sorry, what is the name of that technique, Erin? Shibori. Shibori. Oh, yeah. And what's the name of that actual art piece that you put around your neck? This one right here that I just put around my neck is called Petite Garden. Um, it's definitely my most popular style. Uh, my clients really like it for this asymmetrical hang. You can, hang, you can wear it kind of straight down, um, but the piece itself really wants to go off to the side. So yeah. definitely, definitely one of my more popular styles. And then I like to wear it with like a lighter, um, you know, earring, and then even put it with something like this. This is a uh, Palm Noir for, oh my gosh. And then- Palm have, Noir. Yeah. Looks Love it. stylish, very cool. Can oh, I ask wow. you, Erin, what is the material, um, what type of fabric do you use for the masks? For the masks, the masks are 100% cotton, um, and they're a high quality quilting cotton. 
Um, so I went to Cynthia's Fine Fabrics up in Coral Springs, another local uh, entrepreneur and business person. And she has a very, very nice um, variety of cotton fabrics. And I've been, I've been, I bought my silk from her locally in the beginning. Um, and she's been a great supporter of mine. So um, that's where I've been getting my, my silks there. And she has lots of different uh, patterns and lots of different motifs. Wow. I really wanted to, you've, Sophie, you've asked me uh, what some requests have been. So I've gotten lots of different requests for masks, um, including, <laughs> including hairdresser fabric, sloths, and uh and like co collegiate patterns like uf and fsu and that sort of wow. thing i mean i have decided to stick with um my brand and i feel like the patterns and the the colors that i've picked are definitely things that my clients would like to wear definitely yes. yeah so my my clients want to wear uh, this, oh, it looks like we have something from Jennifer that she can't, that she can't see me. So. Oh, that's weird. Um, let me, let me get back to you. Oh, you okay. Awesome. Okay, good. Hi, Jennifer. Got me. Yay. Good. Okay, good. Sure. <laughs> I think we got, I think we got caught up there just with, with the story. So, uh, uh, we didn't put the camera back, but I'm sorry about that, but we got you back now. Okay, good. And the, the, the. Masks also have this extra liner here of interfacing. Um, so the CDC and Dr. Fauci came out with and said that um, what works best is two different fabrics. Um, so you wanna combine, so I use cotton and then a non-woven interfacing. And then of course, again, the pocket is available for extra filters if the, if the wearers- uh, Oh, I love that. Would prefer that. So. And you can wash them. And they are machine washable. Yes, they are. Oh, amazing. I like, definitely, <laughs> this, is, this is the one I've been wearing around town for, for almost uh, two weeks now. Uh, are, you, so. are you getting people stopping you on the street with the masks as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. So we want to say uh, to our audience that, you know, at this time of the show, when we get to the end part of our hour together, we really like to do the lightning round or in this in this instance, our power questions 5,000. <laughs> that's when we invite the audience to ask any kind of question uh, of Erin Bassett, and we will uh, ask her uh, any kind of fun or irreverent questions and to find out more about who she is and what she likes to do, and a little bit um, not about her art, just about who she is as a person. And I'm gonna get started. Uh, Aaron, if you could visit any place on earth at any time of existence, when and where would you go and why? Oh my gosh, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> um, oh my goodness, when would I, well, okay. So there is this urban myth about how silk was created. The urban myth is that there was this princess in, um, in the palace grounds drinking a cup of tea and a silk cocoon falls in her tea and she, she pulls it out and it's all this filament and it's, it was a silkworm cocoon. And so she went to her ladies in waiting and said, um, I would like you to spin this into yarns and then create, and then use the yarns and the threads to, to weave a fabric. So they did it. And she took the sample to her husband, the emperor and said, I would like to produce this. And the legend goes that it was actually women who discovered, produced and cultivated silk for the first like 300 years. And as we all know through history, it became a commodity in the new world. There was the Silk Road. It was put in treasuries along with gold and silver and sugar and chocolate and silk. So I would love to go back to that time to see that point in time when the cocoon drops into the teacup to see if it actually happened. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. And that's definitely a first 
Uh, I've never heard a story like that during the Power Questions 5000. And we <laughs> want to encourage the audience at home, if you have a power question, then please bring it on. Bring uh, it on. Sophie, do you have a power question for Aaron? Um, I mean, I always end up asking the same thing, you know, like what are your shows in Netflix or Hulu, but I'm going to ask another question. So yeah. I'm looking here online. So how do you feel about putting pineapple on pizza? Uh, I like it. You I like, like it Hawaiian? You like it Hawaiian? I like pineapple on everything. And actually <laughs> there's a great, I know Ed shaking his head. Okay. So there's a great <laughs> local restaurant called Kiko's Japanese food in the fountains that makes the most amazing fried rice that has bacon and pineapple and raisins in it. It's the house special fried rice and my husband and I love it. It's amazing. Wow. Pineapple and everything. I just bought pineapple salsa for Cinco de Mayo. I can do pineapple on pizza. Pineapple on Hawaiian pizza. Night. Yeah, I can do that. Pineapple on everything, I'm concerned. So respect your pizza. <laughs> Guys, no judgment, you, gotta, you gotta respect your pizza. <laughs> Uh, personally, that's, you know, whatever. To each their own, you know? <laughs> so, Aaron. No, that's a pers that's personal taste. That's personal taste, and you're wrong. Um, <laughs> no, if you want to have pineapple, I'm all for it, uh, except just not on my slice. That's right. Uh, <laughs> and we can do that. If you could have the power to fly or the power to be invisible, which one would you pick? Oh, probably fly. Yeah. And why? Uh, just the bird's eye view. I mean, I think we live in a beautiful world. And if we can, if we can start to save it, since it's coming back so much after the humans have been quarantined, um, if we can save this beautiful planet, I mean, I just think that it's breathtaking. I mean, I went to I went to Ireland um, two years ago for my honeymoon and we went to the Cliffs of Moher. You know, and we went out and we looked down and, oh man, would I love to like just take off and fly around that landscape and see all the different wow. things. I, see? I mean, as a, I mean, I started as a photographer. I'm a, I'm an artist and a visual person. So, um, you know, I definitely think that the power of invisibility wouldn't, wouldn't do much for me nearly as much as the power of flight. So plus airline tickets are really expensive. So why <laughs> I agree. But hey, for oh, real, like, huh? No, go ahead, please. No, no, I just wanted to ask like a serious question. Like, what are you watching on Netflix right now? Like, uh, any series and movies recommendations? Uh, Outlander, for sure. Okay, I started watch. I think I watched the first season. Yeah. Yeah, the first season and the fourth season are the best. Okay, so what what is Outlander about? Outlander is actually about time travel. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah. So it's about a woman going back to the 1700s and going through history. And it's also a love story. So it's got sci-fi, it's got fantasy, <laughs> um, you know, it's got a lot of sexy scenes in it. The actors are great. So, you know, that's, that's what I'm watching right now. But I it's also like, it's, it's well that. done. It's very like well the done. the photography yeah. and the set. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the costumes. Oh my gosh, the costumes. That I love, and I'm a huge fan of the um, uh, the Hunger Games for yes. because of the costumes. I mean, Effie, if I could have made, I mean, why why did Effie not wear that? In exactly, one of the exactly. That's what I. Oh my gosh. Well, there 100%. are coming out with a Hunger Games seek uh, a prequel, so you got to get on that and. Um, Whoever All right, so who has the number of the main costume designer for <laughs> the Ed, get on that. Yeah, get me get me that number. Yeah. I will I will go back into the ArtServe archives and I'm pretty sure we've got Effie's <laughs> number in there. Uh, yeah. Well, um it do we have any more comments or questions before we uh come to the end of the interview, Sophie? Any more power five thousand questions? We don't have any questions, but everyone um, loved know, getting to know you and your work. And I am so grateful to have you as part of the Arcer family. And, and we love having you around and every time you come and visit. So this was great. And I am 
buy my mask as soon as we end with these two. <laughs> All right, you better hurry up because if you want these two colors, I, I have the browser already open in my laptop. Like I already know the one that I want. Okay, good. I'll make it for you. My pleasure. <laughs> All right, Erin, I'm going to give you one more chance to hold up some masks and uh, give your website out so people can go uh, buy them for themselves as gifts for families and friends or for the office. So go ahead. Okay, so um, here are my masks, 100% cotton with a pocket filter, machine washable, made in America. Um, you can buy these and all of my pieces that you see here um, at AaronBassettArtistry.com. Um, and I'm not sure if we mentioned this earlier, but just like my necklaces, a portion gets donated to Alzheimer's. For every mask that I sell, I am donating a mask to the caretakers that are taking care of my mom right now while I can't be there for her. So you buy one and one gets donated to a local healthcare worker. That and that's ambassadartistry.com. That is absolutely incredible. And we're so thankful uh, that you were here with us today. And uh, we're so thankful for our audience at home for watching this interview and uh, watching you show off your amazing Silk Shibori artwork. This has been the Art and Chat with Aaron Bassett.